All right, welcome everyone, and thanks to be here again at this new session of the Machine Learning Coffee Seminar of Kai. And we are very lucky to have with us today Martin Andro, uh, who's going to who's a assistant professor at the Alto University, and he's going to talk about accelerating AI, AI algorithms on the edge. And we are very much looking forward to your talk. Thanks, Martin. Thank you. Um, okay, so actually, uh, maybe I will quickly introduce myself before the presentation. So um, I'm a hardware designer. I'm a circuit designer. Um, so I guess it's a bit different perspective uh, from 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 the, the talks that I usually also attend when I when I see this machine learning coffee seminar. And so the idea today is that maybe I would give you a bit more idea about how we actually accelerate uh, different AI algorithms. Um, on the edge and, and focusing a bit more on the hardware side and even on, on like very dedicated hardware accelerators. So of course, uh, uh, maybe I don't need to convince you uh, the need for edge AI. So, so we have uh, the number of embedded AI applications or, or exploding. We see that in internet of things, in our mobile phones, the automotive industry is also having more and more electronics, more and more sensors. And, those sensors, we want them to be smart, and we want also them to consume a low amount of power. So they have a fundamental trade-off between functionality and, and energy. So we want to have everything uh, embedded on the edge, all these machine learning algorithms running directly even on the platform, because it has a lot of advantages, it allows for more privacy, it's faster to compute, and also it's more sustainable because you do not have to communicate, for example, uh, data through the cloud or everything. So, so they have a lot of advantages, but the problem is that, okay, if you take a regular AI algorithm, so for example, um, neural networks uh, that are uh, having, for example, image recognition tasks, uh, such as like ImageNet data sets or AlexNet RaceNet type of networks, they actually have millions or even billions of computations just to compute them one time uh, and do one time the inference. And uh, we know that for embedded systems, power is already like a big bottleneck. And uh, of course, when we have now to say that, okay, to uh, uh, see, like uh, have an image, then you, you require like gig amount of computation, then obviously it will increase the, the power consumption of all these systems. And so there is, there, is a, there is an idea that has emerged a long time ago, that is how do we actually accelerate some of these algorithms on the edge. And uh, so I will talk about two types of algorithms. So uh, the first part is the biggest part is neural networks because they are the most used algorithm nowadays and deep, deep neural networks in particular. So I will explain basically how, how we compute those and then uh, what has been done in terms of acceleration for, for this type of model. So starting with generic platforms uh, like processors or GPUs and going towards more dedicated platforms. So those are custom integrated circuits. And here we will see that, okay, there are different approaches relying on digital computation, but also analog computation. And see that, that, that uh, there have been a lot of progress, but uh, now it's time to integrate everything in, in, in big systems and see how it goes. And then maybe tomorrow uh, we would look for other types of models. Maybe neural networks are, um, I don't know, going to continue. Maybe there are other models that, I will, that, that, that will be uh, better there and one type of model that I'm interested in are probabilistic models and in particular probabilistic circuits and then I will uh, tell a bit about uh, maybe what are probabilistic circuits although maybe most of you are familiar with this and then how we compute them how we can accelerate them and, and what we do um, in our current research for for that purpose okay so if we start with the artificial neural networks well I guess uh, all of you know how pretty much how neural networks are composed. So for me as a hardware designer, I just say that there's are layers of neurons that are interconnected together. So um, they are, uh, so this is the example here, like of a fully connected layer. So we have different uh, uh, neurons in the N minus one layer and then uh, other neurons in the N layer. And when we want to compute, for example, uh, what each neuron is actually going to compute, uh, in a very simplified way, it is uh, called multiply and accumulate. So every neuron is going to take the inputs, multiply them by a given weight, and then accumulate over all possible uh, inputs that are connected to this neuron. And then once this is done, then there is a usually nonlinear activation function that can be rectified linear unit, sigmoid function, hyperbolic tangent, anything. So this is the nonlinear part. 
And then, of course, when we have different layers and that are interconnected, there are there are different uh, other operations, uh, pooling, batch normalization, etc. But I'm going to omit them here because it has been shown that multiply and accumulate operations are very very dominant in the computation of neural networks. Sometimes maybe maybe 80 or 90 percent of the total computation. So people are really focused on seeing how we can do this multiply and accumulation um, very efficiently. And uh, if we go a bit deeper into how, how we compute those, so we could just, uh, for example, have simple equations uh, that are just determining in the, how we compute, for example, here, one given neuron on one given layer. And so, so it works for uh, one type of uh, layer, like fully connected here, but it also works in very similar way when we have, for example, the convolutional neural networks. Um, we have different kernels, and instead of having the weights, we just uh, the general weights, we have the kernel weights, and then we have a small window in the, um, uh, in the for example, the input image uh, that we have here, and we're just going to repeat the same operation many times because we're going to slide over these windows, but the kernel weights are the same. And so that's been also studied that, okay, maybe we can, we can have this as a small graph example where we have, in that case, three different kernels that are connected to um the the same output uh, uh, kind of layer or output neuron and uh, and it means in hardware interesting uh, fact that like when we have those in parallel then we can execute them in parallel in the in the circuit and then more parallelism means more hardware efficiency usually so that that's that's how uh, we can decompose the computation so for every uh, let's say part of the uh, neuron that uh, the neural network that we're going to compute uh, for example, one convolutional layer here, one kernel. Uh, we have this type of computation. So I just put them as a graph here again. So we have uh, every time an input multiplied by a certain weight, we accumulate the result, and then we have some nonlinear activation function. And the whole idea is to say that, okay, this is very regular. So if we have several kernels, we can replicate that several times. It's always the same computations. And uh, either we compute them just once for fully connected layer, but we can also compute them many times when we have a convolution so that we cover the whole uh, space. So, so the basis of the computation is this multiply and accumulate. And then of course, parallelism is key because as every computation is pretty much similar for all kernels, then we can just uh, have one specific hardware structure and then replicate that. Um, many times. And the overall idea is how we now can do these computations as efficiently as possible. And so when, when we talk about hardware accelerators, then there are different metrics that are used to compute uh, how they can compare and how they can uh, work together. And I chose one that is not perfect, but that is usually the one that is used a lot in hardware community. So one axis that we have here is the y-axis, that is the speed. So the in, in number of operation per second, oops. So like here it's in giga number of operation per second. So this is how fast basically you're able to compute, the faster, the better. And then there is the power consumption and power consumption means like the power consumption of the accelerator itself. And it goes from, uh, let's say data centers uh, from the left, uh, from the right side. And if you go to the left, there's different type of application, but essentially the edge is, is let's say maybe below around one, one milliwatts, one watt, for example, or a few watts of power consumption. And, and IoT is uh, down maybe 100 or less than 100 of milliwatts. So maybe what kind of uh, your smartwatch, for example, is, is, is consuming these days. So we need uh, essentially to be uh, uh, very efficient. So we have a trade off usually between speed and power. And actually, if you look at this graph diagonally, what you see is uh, that here, you would plot all the accelerator that would have the same efficiency. And this is given in number of operations per second and per watt. Uh, so one tops per watt, one tera operation per second, and also with one watt of power consumption. And uh, so the current target is, uh, as we said, so we need like billions of computation in some, somewhere around 10 milliwatts. So the current target for uh, accelerators is go to, to go towards 1,000 tera operation per second per watt. And that would enable, for example, to compute ResNet in something like a millisecond uh, with somewhere around 10 to 10 milliwatts, maybe, for example, uh, of power consumption. So that would really means this would be embedded in, in an edge device and uh, quite you can do all the computations there. So ideally we want to be, let's say here, so we want to, 
uh, be like fast, very fast, and or we can go all along this red line. This is pretty much the same in terms of efficiency, but that's like the target where, where we are. Okay, so we, we can start with, for example, processors. So, so, so basic processors, they are based on, on um, um, architecture called von Neumann architecture, where we have separation between where the computation happens and where the data is stored. Uh, so when we have a CPU, for example, we have uh, an arithmetic logic unit that can do a lot of computations, uh, many, many type of different computations. And then there is a memory from which we fetch the data and store the data back. And as there are trade-offs in, in memory design, uh, so we have to have usually a memory hierarchy. And uh, the, that is exactly the problem that we have. So this is highly adaptable. This is really scalable. That's why we have so uh, performant, like so, so good uh, performance for, for computers nowadays, because they can pretty much do everything. But in that case, as we are doing all the time the same computation, and we are doing it a million times, then the power is highly dominated by by memory transfer. And if you look at the small table I have here, so usually the cache memory is done with uh, SRAM that are very small, very efficient, but they're also very expensive to produce. And then when we want bigger storage capacity, we have dynamic RAM. So we have this big, uh, bigger RAM that is also very cheap to produce, but very, very slow and power efficient, not power efficient to access. So if you take the basic, uh, uh, for example, uh, figures here. So if you consider that the energy of an addition is one, then accessing the data one time from the SRAM is cost already 55 times more energy. And or from the DRAM, it's almost no go. So it's cost thousand times more energy to, to fetch the data uh, from there. And so as you can see, the idea would be that we somehow amortize several addition and multiplication over the accelerator so that we can um, have a lower cost uh, let's say in terms of, of, of um, uh, memory access. Uh, so having more cores, more parallelism is one key and less memory transfer is, is what we want to do. And uh, if we plot the uh, actually processors in this, in this graph, then we see that they are pretty much opposite to where we want to go. So this is very powerful processor that is in, usually in data centers and it actually doesn't compute very fast and it uh, computes with very, very low efficiency. Uh, so it's, uh, let's say, quite bad and obviously uh, not suited for any type of edge application. So there are other solutions that, uh, that, uh, that are needed. So um, a first idea is to say that, okay, we can use GPUs. And GPUs are very good because uh, they have initially been developed for the purpose of modern, like parallel, highly parallel processing and computation. So for graphical processing, where we have all the pixels of the image that need to be computed uh, or a display, for example, at, at any point in time. And uh, so they have a very a lot of uh, possibilities for parallelism. And essentially, GPUs are very small cores that are all connected together, where you can have also a small memory that is associated to each core. And uh, then still, you need to, most of the time, uh, talk with the bigger memory. But at least here, you can distribute the computation over, let's say, maybe thousands or, or more of cores. So, that's interesting, um, but the problem is that um, first there is a big challenge in terms of software or a compiler. So how do you optimally map all your computation to all these cores? So that, that, that can be uh, an issue. So you still have to really think about how the memory transfers are going to be limited there. And uh, as a result, it can still be dominated by, by this memory transfer. And still also that in terms of efficiency, well, you can still do computation, but it's not dedicated computation for AI. It's normally a dedicated computation for graphical processing. Slightly different, but um, let's say the efficiency could still be improved. And actually, this is what we see when, when we plot how the GPUs are performing. So all the points here are different commercial GPUs. And as you can see, you gain a lot in terms of speed. So you compute a lot faster, uh, two, three, four order of magnitudes, it can be. But it's not a lot more efficient. Uh, you gain maybe one order of magnitude if you compare. So the, the processor and you just go uh, one order of magnitude to the to the left. Um, so so it is better, but still uh, for edge application we are still kind of far uh, from being able to to have this uh, thing on the edge. So the solution is is to have more efficiency and then more dedicated platforms. And uh, simply to say that is just okay. We can keep this kind of multi-core. 
But now instead of computing different things, we are just going to compute multiply and accumulate because that's where the bottleneck is. So we are going to develop um, accelerators that can compute only uh, multiply and accumulate operations. And we see how we can also optimize maybe the memory hierarchy so that we have uh, less transfers. And there are two, two ways to do that. The first one is to use this field programmable get arrays, FPGA, so that are, let's say, generic platform, but still you can, you can program them with hardware description language or, uh, or going all the way to have application-specific integrated circuits, so ASICs. And, uh, and so that's what we are going to see now. So, so uh, first of all, if we can see what the PGAs are doing, uh, here we have also different points. So every point is, is one implementation that has been proposed. And uh, you see commercial ones in, in the square, blue square and uh, FPGA test, let's say from academia that are from, mostly from academia, not products that are with the triangles. And you see that actually it's, it's quite good. So the efficiency starts to be interesting. And, now we can just go down the efficiency of this one tail operation per second per watt. So we can compute more efficiently. And if we trade this off with speed, because we can do that if we do our own type of accelerator, then we, we touch upon this IoT uh, range. So less than hundred milliwatts, for example. So, so it starts to be interesting, but yet maybe in terms of speed, there are still quite a lot of improvements to, to, to do. And uh, this is how uh, digital accelerators have been, uh, been uh, developed. And most of them are developed on a simple principle that is called computing memory or in-memory computing. So uh, the idea is sim simply to say that we are going to design the processor so that uh, there is each processing element that is containing a small memory, a Mac operator, and an accumulator to do the operation many times without having to go uh, to, the, to the memory. So it looks a bit like this. So you still have a big external memory. So there's not much that you can do uh, there. Uh, you, you have global uh, buffers for this, for this uh, uh, like memory that is a bit closer to the processor. And then you have the processing element itself. So you're taking input data, you're taking the weights, you do the multiply and accumulate uh, as a vector, and then you can accumulate also the result over several uh, operations. And also you can do an optimization of the memory hierarchy. Uh, so for example, you, you have just a very efficient memory, but that can be only a small amount that is, that is inside the processing element. You have an intermediate memory that is a bit bigger, but also costs a bit more uh, power to access. And then you have the bigger uh, the dynamic RAM that, that is very big, that contains, for example, all the weights and all the, all the inputs. And then uh, they are, they are um, it's a very expensive to, to, to take data from, from. And, um, and so, but at least you can optimize this hierarchy. And, uh, and so you can actually do much better and much better means, so there are a lot of digital accelerators that have been proposed and much better is maybe two to three the order of magnitude, both in terms of power and also um, a bit one or two order of magnitude in terms of, of speed. And uh, so, so you have also commercial accelerators that are starting to pop up. They are main vendors, uh, main companies that are trying to do their own type of accelerator. And uh, they now perform slightly better than, for example, GPUs. But if you look at prototypes from, from, from several uh, academia uh, papers, uh, then still we are getting much, much better. And we are going closer to this 1,000 ter operation per watt. Um, so with this, you can just really literally tailor your accelerator to really what you want to do. But again, there are some, some, some trade-offs um, and some, some trade-offs are, are in terms of hardware. So the first trade-off is reconfigurability. So if you allow more uh, configuration possible, then you usually pay in terms of energy efficiency. And we know that, okay, different applications are requiring different resolution or different size. And etc. So, so this is a very key challenge on how to make this hardware also um, having several types of models, several types of neural networks, for example. And then sparsity, because sparsity is, is said that okay, um, there are a lot of computation in the neural network that are actually zero, so they could be skipped. And in terms of hardware, they are just costing power for for nothing. Uh, so, so seeing how to manage this sparsity is a, is, a, is a big issue. But what I see that the very biggest uh, problem here is the hardware software interface. So how do you maximize the use of these processing elements? How many do you use? How do you uh, 
throw the data in there. Uh, how do you schedule it? Uh, how do you compile, uh, for example, your program for, let's say, from TensorFlow or something like that? So this is this is very key, and uh, this is on, uh, only a bit touched upon nowadays with, with some research. And then um, we could also say that in terms of software, already not less of a specialist there, but um, I think there are many things that, that 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 can be done. For example, quantizing networks uh, according to the hardware, so putting the hardware in the loop. Uh, when you train neural networks also just to see that how you can quantize them uh, as more efficiently as possible and then optimizing even the the the, the, the network structure itself pruning etc so, so that is um, uh, that can be done and then of course online training is a very big issue because now if we talk about here we talk just about inference if we talk about training we need much higher resolution uh, we need uh, uh, even more computation uh, orders of magnitude more so that is also something that is that is a key challenge. So this, so those digital accelerators, they are one one type of approach. And the other type of approach that I just wanted to talk about is is uh, actually to say that maybe we do not need to do the computation in digital, but we can go back to the old times when computation was actually done in analog. And it's known that in analog uh, computation is more efficient if you have lower resolution. And actually, analog computation is relatively simple. So if you think about the neural network, you, you just think about it in terms of a crossbar, so a big matrix. And every uh, input are broadcasted to different columns. And uh, at the intersection of this column, you are going to multiply a given input by the weight. Uh, and for multiplication, you just use basic uh, electronic laws, uh, saying that, for example, voltage um, is equal to the resistor value times the current. And uh, then if you use the inverse of the resistor, you just say that I have inputs, they are multiplied by this conductance. So one over R and then it, so I have a voltage that enters, it's multiplied and then I have a current and this current is uh, proportional to the value of this, uh, this resistor. So if the value of this resistor is changing because it's representative of the weight, then I have the multiplication there. And then for addition, it's even simpler because now if you have currents, you can simply connect them together and then they are going to be accumulated like natively because that's what uh, currents do. So it's also very basic uh, electronic law. And so people are, are, are trying to figure out how we can make this uh, easily. So how we can have these weights that are configurable and then we're going to accumulate all the result over this, this over each column. Um, and you can do that with the uh, fancy uh, new technologies that are coming, or you can also do that with the technology that we have because it can also be that you are using a capacitor that you charge for a given amount of time, and uh, and and this will provide uh, what you what you need. So um, with that, we can uh, build what we call mixed signal macros. Uh, so those are the macros that are that are seen here. So it's the same principle. So inputs are coming here They're in yellow. They are broadcasted to all columns at the same time, and then weights are coming uh, in blue here. And uh, what you can see that is essentially that you have um, uh, one neuron or one kernel that is computed uh, in one column with the MAC. And then if you have the second kernel, then you can just use the second column. You are going to broadcast the inputs and the weights still, and it's doing the computation. And if the weights, for example, are staying the same, you can just, uh, you don't have to update the weights. You just have to update the inputs and then the computation is, is much more energy efficient and actually um, you accumulate the result over the colon and you can do, for example, a half a million Mac in one clock cycle with this type of architecture. So that have been demonstrated. So, so this is very, very uh, powerful. And, um, but then you need uh, several things. So, so this inside is analog. Uh, so usually you need data converters. Uh, so you need uh, uh, DAX or digital to analog conversion or analog to digital conversion. And this is costing a lot of, of power and a lot of uh, area as well. So there are also many challenges. And then of course, we are still going back to this idea. So, so how do we offload this, this computation to these accelerators? That is also uh, something that is quite complex. But uh, with this idea, it can be seen that, that this current target can be, can be uh, set. So, so, so this 1000 tera operations per second per, per watt. And, uh, I'm just going quickly through some challenges, but uh, so, so people have developed single macros uh, and uh, they are very good if you use them 100%, but the problem of course is that you never use them 100%. It has been even proven that you use them a few percent. 
So, so if you gain uh, 100 times better efficiency, but you use it only 1%, then, then you just let back to square one. And also those macros, they have a lot of non-idealities that are very complex to, to integrate. So one, one issue is to, to, to integrate those in a full system. And uh, so, so for example, how, how often do we have to write the weights in the memory that costs a lot? Uh, what kind of custom compiler and scheduler we, we are going to, to have to use. And I'll just give you an example uh, uh, for, for this part. So it's a sheet that has been presented by uh, people from Leuven, IMEC and, and K Leuven, that is uh, embedding two digital cores, two, sorry, two uh, AI accelerator cores, one digital core that is used for high precision layers, uh, that is a lower efficiency, and one of these analog core that can do this uh, 1,000 by 500 uh, computation in one go. So it's very, very energy efficient, but precision is low. And it's also very challenging to see how you map the, the network to actually such a big matrix. But if you take the performance in terms of a system, so you can compute ResNet in, uh, in uh, three, uh, six uh, milliseconds, which is quite impressive. And then uh, you have uh, around 20 ter operation per second per watt. And, and that is maybe one, one key issue that we could, we could keep there. So, so although this hardware can achieve this 1,000 ter operation per second and per watt, if you use it at 100%, then when you're using the system, then it goes way back to two order of magnitude less in terms of, uh, of, of power consumption. And so all this gap is essentially 100x, and uh, sorry, and it can be uh, just solved by um, by a very efficient mapping between hardware and software. So the hardware is very good, the software is very good because deep neural networks can solve many tasks now. But there is a gap still that is quite huge between how optimally we could use this kind of new hardware, uh, and uh, and uh, that is that is kind of my uh, takeaway there. <laughs> For you that uh, that there's a lot of work to be done in the hardware software uh, type of integration okay maybe if i have a bit of time i i, I will uh, talk about what we do in terms of uh, of probabilistic circuits but maybe maybe uh, if people have questions then i can take questions now uh, if if you want i just had this as a maybe as a backup also if people are interested in this i can stay a bit more Okay. Okay. So, so, so now we have seen we have seen uh, uh, neural networks, and I cannot say a lot because we have also industry projects going on. So we have to wait. Uh, we have the result, but I have also academy project with actually with Antti Hutinen from from uh, University of Helsinki, who is here now, and uh, we are uh, thinking about acceleration of probabilistic circuits. So, so maybe quick motivation for why would we use this in in, in AGI? Well, first of all, uh, there is uncertainty. When we have decision-making systems, then they they are they are uncertain, and and uh, one way to deal with this uncertainty is to have uh, methods like probabilistic theory that can deal with that in a principled way. And so then we are instead of having, for example, a classifier, then we learn a generic probability distribution, um, which is one one uh, interesting thing because now uncertainty is taken into account. The second thing is that when we want to retrain, it's it's very challenging. So so um, it's better if we have models that can answer uh, several questions or queries without needing for retraining. And with probabilistic models, uh, so most of them you can do that. Um, so this is very interesting for us. And also energy efficiency is, is very crucial. And uh, uh, in that sense, there are some probabilistic models that can be made tractable. Uh, so it means reliable and efficient. So reliable means that you can answer queries in an exact way. You don't need to make approximation. And, Efficient essentially is that you manage the number of computations. So when your problems is becoming more complex, uh, the model doesn't explode. And uh, one key idea for, for uh, having those three, uh, let's say things at the same time is to use probabilistic circuits. So they are computational graphs uh, that are coding a probability distribution. And for me, it's very interesting because there are many applications that could do that. Uh, for example, embedded decision-making or online self-learning systems, even if we can retrain a bit online. Uh, so, so it's very interesting. The problem is that there are not a lot of accelerators, and also there are not a lot of unified training framework uh, that are available to to use and to accelerate probabilistic circuits. So, so, so one thing that um, we do is we try to see how to accelerate those, those circuits, and there has been formalized the term probabilistic circuits 
quite recently because there were many type of models like some product networks, arithmetic circuits, etc. And so now they have been somehow formalized as, as probabilistic circuits. So they are composed of uh, some nodes that are doing mixture model of, of different variables with certain weights that essentially are probabilities, product nodes that are factorizing over the same uh, variables and leaf nodes that are containing uh, binary indicators saying if a specific variable is observed or not, or can be also even containing some probability distributions. So those can be learned from data and then you can constrain the structure for, for tractability. So I guess I'm, most of you are way more familiar <laughs> Than me with this, so I'm just going through quite quickly. But the idea is now to see how we compute those. So essentially, they are already computational graphs, which is interesting. Uh, but the problem doesn't come from the fact that it's hard to compute. The problem comes from the fact that different parts of the graphs are going to be computed differently. So if we have, for example, a very simple example here, uh, then still you have this again this multiply and accumulate operation that happens in the in the sum node because you, you need to multiply by the weights. Um, but also you have extra products that are coming here. So, so you have more products uh, in that, that in the case of the neural network. And also if you take another part of the graph, you have other type of computation. So, so it's not regular, it's irregular. And uh, while you could compute usually many queries in just one path through the, the circuit, then the problem, and you don't have also, you just have linear functions. Uh, then the problem comes that uh, every computation is different. And so it's a hard, you cannot have a one-on-one -on -one mapping with some hardware block that would do this computation. Uh, so uh, the problem is mostly parallelism. So, so since how you need to know how you can compute the different parts of the graph, what you can do in parallel, what you have to do sequentially, et cetera. So this is a bit complicated. And there are other specificities for, for probabilistic circuits. So they have very high computation resolution because essentially you multiply probabilities together and then you add probabilities together and et cetera. So it leads to very, very small values. So usually they are even computed in the log domain, not in the linear domain, but in linear, it can be, I don't know, 50 bits float, 64 bit floats, for example, just used for computation. And so the fact that it is irregular, it requires the accelerator to have interconnects, to have intermediate memories. And what people have done so far is that they have done essentially a processing element that can do um, in the same way that can do uh, addition or multiplication or nothing. And then since those graphs are usually shaped a bit like trees, then the processing element also are shaped like trees. And then you just try to map every part of the graph to these uh, trees of processing element and then trying to interconnect them together. But, but of course, it's, a, it's a, sounds less straightforward than, than for, for example, neural networks. And, and this is one thing that we are trying to solve uh, in our work. So what we are trying to do is, first of all, to have a generic tool for training probabilistic circuit that takes into account different models and then evaluate these models on hardware, to see which one are the best and also to see if we can find patterns in this graph. So, so we take, for example, a, a given probabilistic circuit that we train, uh, then we translate that into an equation to, to that is the, that the, the input of our, our tool. And uh, then we compile this equation for hardware implementation. So we identify the product node, the sum nodes. Uh, we identify how they are grouped together, what type of variable they contain. And then we can generate uh, automatically hardware description language and, for example, put that in FPGA. But what is, would be interesting is to have completely custom accelerators. And for that, the idea is to try to find patterns. So right now, our tool is, is uh, trying to do that. So, so finding different patterns in the graph and see how we can compute those. And if this is possible, then we can build an accelerator because we have a graph that is made only with known patterns and patterns are, are custom designed on hardware for, for, for energy efficiency. So we have computation units used and these CUs are com composed of, for example, trees of, of elements again, and those are computation uh, elements, CEs. And every element is just computing a certain type of computation. Maybe this multiply and multiply and accumulate, for example. And then um, we can see how this works. And that can be done from the hardware side, just designing certain blocks. But that can also be done from the training already when we have a certain framework. And then we just change the training so that it can, uh, uh, let's say include only some patterns and, and they are very recent models of probabilistic circuits that are that are trying to do that and so that's that's we are also 
we are looking at. So, so yeah, I, I'm, I think I'm, I'm pretty much uh, in the end of this presentation, those few references that, uh, that I used. And of course, I'm ready to take questions. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. Yeah, very interesting. Is there any question from the audience? So, yeah, I mean, I, I have a question. Yeah. So can you can you yeah so can you go back to yes yeah, so when you start talking about probabilistic circuits? Yes. Here. So yeah, here, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, here. So yeah, I mean, I'm less familiar with probabilistic circuits. Say, so the kind of work you know we do is more like you know a high level uh, probabilistic inference. So it's so it's very. It's very, very high level in a way. And uh, here it's a, so it's a model representation. So is there, a, so you see, a, I said, is there a language or, or a way of reading which is a, you know, kind of high level, um, essentially high level probabilistic programming languages, like, you know, say the ones that are based on, um, you know, like Stan or say, or, you know, other that are based on operation uh, inference uh, can be implemented so it can be kind of you know compiled to this uh, lower level uh, language. Or is it straightforward, or is it something? Yeah. So I, I, for the probabilistic uh, language themselves, like I, so of course I know that there are some that exist, and um, I'm not that familiar with probably let's say all of them. But I think that so there have been previous attempts in in having this this compilation process, uh, not directly from. Uh, so the problem is that, for example, so the first idea that has emerged with the probabilistic circuit, it was not called probabilistic circuit, it's just to say that you train a Bayesian network, and from this Bayesian network, you can compile it into something that's called arithmetic circuit. So this is the same. So the idea is that you, you just extract the, you, you just kind of unroll the computations that are needed to calculate the probabilities, and then you lay them down as a graph, as, as it is like this. And then people figured out that maybe I could train that directly from the data. So, so what it does is, is that it does um, clustering and in the independence tests, try out how to, let's say, build this graph. Essentially, that is the, the basic idea. But I don't know, I have not seen uh, this coming from, from probabilistic languages, but I think it's a good idea. So, so maybe <laughs> maybe some more people know, know here, maybe Antti also, you know, I'm not sure. But, um, uh, I think that like what what we we are looking for is is this so so instead of having the, the arithmetic circuits then we have other types of models like some product networks etc. So um, so it was this compilation process that started to be kind of attractive to us but I have not seen it coming from there but I would say that if if you can get an equation like that with the different computations and well. You have brackets somewhere that actually are telling you what is the order of these computations that I don't see why the tool could not be used for that purpose. So, yeah, so if those probabilistic languages can can do that, then I guess that yeah. it can be compiled directly. And just to see, so would you would you think let's say in terms of description, it's because say would it make would be correct to interpret let's say this kind of this kind of probabilistic circuits have more like um bottom-up approach in the sense that they kind of, you know, as you said, they start from the data and they build this uh, relationship directly, while mm -hmm. traditional probabilistic programming languages, they essentially, they start essentially from some abstract description of the data, which you know, and the generative process, and then, you know, they, they try to impose that on the data, and, you know, essentially, and uh, so would be this kind of, this approach kind of correct, like one kind of bottom up a lot more like top down. Yeah, I think like the, the for example, if you take some product networks, the, the algorithm I think works like this. So first of all, it tries, it's like a bottom, uh, bottom um, sorry, top down approach for the training, but the bottom up approach is mostly for inference. So you start by having the variables that are at the bottom there, and then you walk your way up to the top node to calculate, let's say the given probability that you want. But I think that from the training perspective, you also train it top down. So, so I think this is this is compatible. So, so the, the essentially the training like system is just so that 
you first you try to cluster different type of variables and then it creates like uh, um, a sum node and you do sorry independence test and then you can cluster variables and that's where you get the plus and or the or the mm -hmm. or the product and everything so it works like top down um, <clears throat> but the inference works mostly bottom up so, so conditional probability for example and then you have like a bit better uh, for example most probable explanation when there are variables that are unknown, so you start to, at, the, at the bottom, you go up, and then you can go down again in the graph so that you figure out what was um, the value of the variable that you were looking for. Uh, so, so those are this kind of approach, but usually it starts with the bottom up evaluation. There is a comment by Antti, which is a saving. So, uh, of course, say current methods of this time, uh, I mean, what, what they do is that they do influence to MCMC. Um, so I said, so there is not exact. I mean, that's of course I'd say that's a, that's a large difference. But yeah, I mean, even then, you know, maybe you can imagine it's just some sort of a description of high level core. I mean, it would be very restricted, but you know, some, some, some sort of restriction to uh, some class of distribution, even for probabilistic languages, programming language, in which, you know, they would you would get some sort of relatively close form. So, there might still be some connection, even though it's at the moment, yes, it's, it's not. Yeah. Definitely not I, uh, I guess it's good, then, and then it means that uh, maybe we can come back for another presentation only on probabilistic circuits. Then, <laughs> when the work has been uh, has been has been done, but uh, yeah, so I I I think that like one thing that is interesting for us is 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 destructibility properties, and I'm not mm -hmm. sure that many models. I don't, I don't know how or if it is possible from. Uh, description language to have down to this kind of uh, detail about like uh, yeah. tractability and everything so that 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 is the key for the hardware acceleration so um and uh, so now we are trying to apply also these models in some some kind of real scenarios and recently there have been probabilistic circuits that have been so so now now it, like it's a scalar model so every node has just scalar values but it has been also shown that you can vectorize those and now it becomes a, a a lot more interesting for for acceleration point of view because uh, you 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 have another dimension that is kind of the vector yeah. of each node so each node is vectorized but uh, so yeah there there are many things but I think already from the training perspective and etc there, there are many things that can be done because the, the, I would say that the training algorithms are, are for example that's what we are trying to compare now so um, because if you train a Bayesian networks so I guess it gives you much more freedom and flexibility to train the to train the, the, the model and then you compile it which is just a deterministic process so it doesn't matter and then our, the question is how does this perform compared to what you when you learn this directly from the data is there is there is there a big difference and well we see that there is that can be a very big difference but now we're trying to understand exactly why or how so anti for example is is uh, He's a specialist in 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 uh, Bayesian networks, so he knows many training examples and uh, and uh, tricks. And so, yeah, there, it's not like uh, still a, a, it's like, it has not been very extensively explored. I would say. Okay, thanks. And yeah, I think we are right on time. Good. So, <laughs> is there any other quick question? Okay, otherwise, yeah, we, we thank you again. Uh, thanks to the speaker and Martin, thanks for coming here. It's been a pleasure. Yes, no problem. And yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's quite different from uh, some of the things that you, we typically see. So it's, it's very nice to see, to see kind of this, you know, lower yeah, level I, approach I, and implementation. Yeah, I hope I, I hope uh, it didn't scare anyone. Or <laughs> <laughs> I hope that like it was not too different from, from what is, it is uh, uh, usually, but I think it's also good to have the perspective. Yeah, of the yeah, yeah. I, I think exactly. I mean, yeah, we often kind of you know just see that as a kind of black box. We send stuff on and we get results. So it's, it's good to see these developments. Yep. Thanks okay. a lot. Yeah, thank you. Thanks thank everyone. You. Have a nice day. Bye bye. Yes.